Welcome to my second presentation, this time about licensing. And I think this is important because we have several questions arising from time to time. And actually, there is some work we also urgently have to do in order to conform and comply with all the terms of the different licenses used inside Reactor has. So uh, you could imagine, uh, why do we have so many licenses? It's mainly the third party code we are importing. And this is not a problem as long as we are following all the terms of that. And when our main goal is actually to provide an open source alternative to a proprietary product, we have to get the licenses right. And also, um, well, the companies are usually interested in getting a full list of licenses inside an open source product. But you can probably imagine that. The reason why I am having this presentation today is I got invited by Nuno Brito. He is the founder of TribbleCheck. TribbleCheck is a company that does um, uh, well, it audits software for license identification and compliance. And uh, he actually had a seminar back in May where several uh, German companies were also invited, big companies using open source software, and all of them shared their experiences with that, how to comply and what are easy guidelines. The question, the basic question for Reactor as is always, what can we combine in terms of licensing? And as you could imagine, the hard customer is actually the GPL here, because in contrast to Apache, BSD, CDDL, MIT licenses or whatever, the GPL always affects the entire work and not just files under GPL. So we have to define what is an actual work, and it also affects derivative works, uh, which are based on this actual work. So what does it mean for us? We have actually no problems combining code that is GPL2 only with GPL2 or later. For example, this is done in a little application, VGA font edit which has one source file under GPL2 only and the rest under GPL2 or later. And we also don't have any problems combining GPL2 only code uh, with like two clause BSD. This has arised since the initial ARM work began and much kernel code was licensed under BSD. But even if those are the so-called declared licenses per file, the actually applicable license for the entire work, work being VGA font edit or NTOS kernel is GPL2 only in both cases, because GPL affects the entire work. Now, the other central question, what is a derivative work? And again, I am not a lawyer here, but I have uh, cited my sources, so you can, may later look it up if you're interested. There are several positions uh, defended here. The most uh, problematic one being the Free Software Foundation position. They state on their website that linking a GPL program to any GPL library makes it a derivative work under GPL. That was wrong. It's not just a GPL program, but any program which is linked to a GPL library. Actually, if we had only this rule, most of reactors wouldn't be possible because, well, as a platform that develops the GPL um, uh, Windows components under GPL, we have to link to proprietary Windows applications at some point. Fortunately, there is an exception, and that is, uh, even in the license stakes, linking to major components like compiler, kernel, and so on of the operating system is possible unless that component itself accompanies the executable. 
that would be another point actually for splitting up the tree at some point, because then we could say our component doesn't accompany the rest of the operating system anymore. So we are allowed to link it to proprietary components. I mean, on the other hand, if our reactors applications work under Windows as well, they would also link to proprietary components under Windows and to GPL components under Reactor S. So this is also a position that was presented during the triple check training. Basically, the guideline is if your program depends on a GPL library and this one cannot be exchanged, it is a derivative work. But if your program uses a GPL library over a well-defined interface, that allows an exchange of the component, it is not a derivative work. Their example was directly linking to MySQL would make it a derivative work because MySQL client components are under GPL, but if you use an interface that supports multiple database management systems, and this interface actually also supports MySQL, then it is of course not a derivative work of MySQL. And in my opinion, we could actually apply the same to ReactOS because, well, um, the well-defined interfaces are documented on MSDN. So every ReactOS component actually has a well-defined interface. For example, the spec files are also an interface. So in my opinion, the GPL has its boundaries, well, at the work and everything uh, beyond that is not a derivative work of any reactor as component. Actually, also a popular position I found on the web that linking is only one single indicator for a derivative work. And for example, Canonical as the distributor of Ubuntu also um, defends this position. They recently released ZFS for Linux and they say ZFS is of course not a derivative work of the Linux kernel. It is a self-contained module. The Linux kernel can be used without ZFS and ZFS was actually derived from the ZFS sources and not really from the kernel sources. It uses the kernel interface but it is a self-contained module and as such it can have a different license than the Linux kernel itself. And I think this is a position that's quite logical and we could actually make use of that as well. I have again listed what that actually means for us. For most of ReactOS, using the GPL doesn't affect the license of linked modules. As I already said, the DLLs and drivers have well-defined interfaces. They are even documented on MSDN. We can always exchange them by their non-GPL Windows counterparts. That proves even more that this is a well-defined interface because the component can be exchanged. And for some cases, even the official FSF exception major components of the operating system applies. This means in total, we can link different modules under different licenses, as long as these stay different modules. In my opinion, this gets even better because we can drop the additional lines that were added in 2012 to our GPL text. I'm not sure if you have seen them, many probably have not, but when you say in our header, uh, GPL C copying in the top level directory, you're actually referring to a modified GPL that lies in our source tree. And this has these additional lines. Reactors may be used, runtime linked, and distributed with non And in my opinion, this adds nothing to the GPL that isn't already allowed when we take all the special cases into account of reactor S. In particular, I see legally no difference between the GPL and the LGPL when implementing a Windows counterpart. Again, that's because of the well-defined interfaces. 
So we can always link just like the, GP, uh, the LGPL allows linking to proprietary programs. Of course, still some no-go's remain. For example, linking a GPL2 wraps to a GPL3 ATLX. We had this, we had this recently. And of course, um, it was great that we had discussed, uh, discussed it and now the GP, uh, now the ATLX library was converted to GPL2 or later, and it is possible again. But you can imagine if this would have not happened, then ATLX becomes a statically linked part of wraps. It cannot be exchanged, and as such, it is a combined work of wraps and ATLX that needs to be under a compatible license. I think it's obvious, but it has happened in the past, not just in our project, but you can't just take Microsoft sample code and drop a GPL on it. And um, well, if, there, if any such things remain, then they must be changed, of course, or at least the original license must be retained. You also cannot just take any code you find on the internet that has no license attached at all. So every time we add new code to React OS, we have to check that a license header is included. It would be very troublesome to do that later. So let's come to the second part. What do we actually need to do? And first priority should actually be ensuring commercial usage because two components actually prevent this right now. These are the full FAT file system library, which is in our tree. It is good for fast FAT new. I'm not sure if there's any more work happening on fast FAT new. So in my opinion, we should drop it entirely. It is under a license that is incompatible to commercial usage. And the other thing are the wallpapers, but for the next release, I think they should be changed anyway. Or you can, of course, always renegotiate with the author to get a license that is compatible with commercial usage. Gladly, this only affects these two components. I have checked this. Um, it was some time ago that I have already checked our licenses, but um, yeah, I think these are the only components actually preventing commercial usage. But I don't want to say maybe something else happened in the meantime and we have even more components that need some work now. The second, com uh, the second topic is actually about using SPDX license headers. This is a de facto standard for enabling tools to pass your code and compile a list of all used licenses. Um, they actually suggest a header, but they basically interpret any header as long as it uses the SPDX license headers. You can go to spdx.org. It is a Linux foundation managed project and they have the short names of all licenses they know there. You could just reference them. You even get a link to the license. And I think this would make it easy and it would make it uh, verifiable because right now, most people just write GPL, see, copy, see copying in the top level directory. They don't refer to a particular version of the GPL. They don't refer to GPL2 or GPL2 or later, and most don't even know that they refer to a changed version of the GPL. So I have given an example here. Um, it just requires actually changing the license line. And of course, you should always keep a copyright line with all the authors up to date if you don't do yet. So it's later easy to figure out who to contact if you ever need to change the license. For third party components, there's also the possibility to use so called what about files. This is also an established syntax and they can give additional information about all used third party uh, 
components. This would actually give us the first complete list of all your third party components. And it's important that you put all the information in there, which I have in this example. For example, the version and the license at that time. There are some components which change the license over time. For example, um, there is a PDF generation component called iText, which was GPL and then switched to Afero GPL. That means several, com uh, several um, companies now cannot use it anymore or need to switch to a commercial license. And there are also components like FreeType, which are offered in different licenses. For example, FreeType always states in all source files that they are using the FreeType license. This is actually compatible with Apache and with GPL3, but not with GPL2. So what we need to do is stating that we use FreeType under the also offer GPL2 license. is basically what I stated. And finally, we should fulfill some license paperwork. For example, the Apache license requires author attribution. They say that you have to state this component is shipped under the Apache license. And in my opinion, we, should, we could actually do that in the uh, system properties because this one already has a new license button and there it currently only shows the GPL. So we could compile a whole list of licenses there, all licenses we are using, and also the attribution in prominent places that is required for the Apache license. So for the record, the question was whether it's enough to just add a link to the GPL. And in my opinion, as most projects do it that way, we should actually add the whole license text at least to our tree. And in my opinion, if you if you have a look again at uh, this particular um, window and check what others are doing if when you install a uh, software we uh, they usually show you a uh, license text and this is usually done in a rich text control and this is where we currently have uh, some performance problems we can only verify them when we install third-party software because this uses a rich text control full of text maybe if we have our own rich text control full of text we can track this problem down easily and also ensure that this doesn't happen again. But I think it's actually the most convincing thing and to regard what I've seen at uh, the triple check seminar, this is also done by German companies who are compiling a full complete list of all used licenses for their customers who are interested. They can just give it to their lawyers then and they check whether the program is usable under the condition. Finally, some little housekeeping. I have told you we have some modules which use different licenses and I don't think this is necessary um, when it just affects, well, the single code file or some lines let's at least make it easier to comprehend if we um, clean up those modules and only use a single license inside them wherever possible. And finally, something I have found that was very interesting. Um, Microsoft had put all Windows driver samples on GitHub some time ago, and this is licensed under MSPL. MSPL has actually an additional clause that grants you rights under all affected patterns by this code. Means if we import Microsoft's FastFAT driver, the VFAT patent from Microsoft, don't know if it's still valid or already all of them expired, but 
they couldn't actually sue us for this. And they have done so in the past and uh, collecting royalties from many companies. Not us, no, we are not big enough for that. Anyhow, I think uh, this window, these Windows driver samples don't just provide great sample code for us, but with the added patent clause in the MSPL, they could also, um, well, we could also use this code to defend us and to make sure that we don't violate any patents. Well, that was it from me. Now I'm open to additional questions, if there are any. So for the record, the question was about uh, statically linking versus dynamically linking. And this is really an often disputed point. If you closely follow what the FSF says, yes, then most Linux distributions would be illegal because as soon as you run a proprietary um, application on it, it would link to GPL components and it would uh, therefore violate the license because it would make it a derived work. And this is why there are many other people other than the FSF who are saying, no, uh, linking is just an indicator and it, it depends on other factors as well. For the dynamically linking, I would say again, it's a defined interface. If you have the CRT, it is a defined documented interface. If your proprietary application links against the CRT, it could also do so on other platforms. That proves even more that it is a well-defined interface. So in my opinion, this is the exception. Dynamic linking is like linking through a well-defined interface as long as you don't make up an interface just for this particular linking. But uh, in most cases, we are following an architecture with, which is well documented and therefore we have well defined interfaces we can link to. And this would actually um, make it possible to use different licenses for both components linking together. You, in most, uh, the, in most cases, you could always um, exchange these components by their Windows counterparts, which are non-GPL, and this way you already see the GPL can't apply to your product. Well, that's it basically then. <laughs>